And it's now that we come to the preaching of God's word. And so I invite you to take your copy of God's word and open to Romans chapter six. Romans chapter six, we're gonna re return to our study of this amazing epistle. And we're gonna be in verses 15 to 19. And I wanna begin by reading this portion of scripture. Romans chapter six, starting in verse 15. Paul writes, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification." Each of us can be divided into one of two masters, divided according to one of two masters, either of sin or of righteousness. And it's our conduct that reveals who our master is. If our lives are marked by obedience to sin, then sin is our master. But if our lives are marked by obedience to righteousness, then righteousness is our master. And so all of us are slaves to a ruling power over our lives. We're either slaves to the ruling power of sin or we're slaves to the ruling power of righteousness. And we all come into this world slaves to the ruling power of sin and need to be set free from sin and enslaved to righteousness. And each one of these masters generates a drastically different conduct and a drastically different outcome. The fruit of slavery to sin is impurity and lawlessness, and the outcome is eternal death. The fruit of slavery to righteousness is obedience to God, and the outcome is eternal life. And so today, what we want to do is subject ourselves to the microscope of God's word to ensure that our allegiance has been truly transferred, to be absolutely certain that we are, in fact, slaves to righteousness. Now, what spearheads these verses is the statement Paul makes in verse 14, where he says, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And because Paul was well-versed in the objections often raised to his gospel, he anticipates a, a misappropriation of that declaration, that to be under grace means that we're entirely free of any moral obligation. And that betrays a fundamentally flawed view of the law, one that's rooted in the faulty assumption that the law is necessary to restrain sin, when in reality, due to man's fallen condition, the exact opposite is true. To be under the law is to be under sin as a power that exercises dominion over our lives. It's to be under a power that aids and abets sin and serves to both amplify and magnify our slavery to sin. And so in much the same way that we must die to sin, we must also die to the law. And that's because it's only by being released from the law that we can bear fruit for God, Romans 7, 4 through 6. As we then fulfill the righteous requirement of the law, not according to the flesh, but rather according to the spirit, Romans 8, 4. And it's in this that we begin to see the, the operation of grace. Because grace isn't just a liberating power, it's also a constraining power. In that it not only liberates us from the law in sin, but also enslaves us to a new ruling power, the ruling power of righteousness. And so, in much the same way that Paul did at the beginning of this chapter, he now renders it 
a theological impossibility that a person could be under grace and go on in sin as though nothing has changed. Utterly impossible it is. Because as verse 18 puts it, having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And to this point in Romans 6, the aim has been to educate and equip you for the pursuit of holiness. But today, we want to make certain that grace is operative in your life, that you have truly died with Christ and have been raised to walk in newness of life. And so the entire thrust of this sermon has that aim in view to make it abundantly clear what life looks like under the rule and reign of these two distinct masters by contrasting the fruit of each ruling power. And if the trajectory of your life signals that you're a a slave of righteousness, then you'll be bolstered all the more to pursue Christ. But if the trajectory of your life signals that you're a slave of sin, then it means that you still need Christ and that you're still under the power of sin. And in either case, it's the Holy Spirit that must make this clear to you. Either that he would testify that you are, in fact, a child of God, Romans 8, 16, or that he would convict you of your ongoing need of repentant faith in Christ. So with that in view, note first the examination. The examination and the way this has worked out, we're going to spend most of our time in this particular point of this sermon. So look at verse 15. Paul says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. And as mentioned, Paul poses a similar question in verse one, where he writes, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? To which he likewise answers, may it never be. Only there... The thrust of the question was whether we should sin to facilitate an even greater display of the grace of God, to put an even greater display of God's glory on display. The question posed here, however, is slightly different. Here in verse 15, the question is whether we should sin because we're under grace, as though being under grace would grant us license to sin. That grace frees us from any and all moral obligation. And there are at least two things to say in connection with this question. One is that there's no logical connection between it and the statement in verse 14. The statement in verse 14 is in place to substantiate why it is that we must not let sin reign. It isn't even remotely close to a statement that implies license to sin. But Paul anticipates the objection, and that's why he goes in this direction. And two, the question posed even here in verse 15 implies a faulty assumption that license to sin is a desirable thing. That to be authorized to sin is some sort of privilege. And yet the exact opposite is true. And Paul alludes to that in verse 21 when he writes, therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? And the answer is nothing. If anything, the answer is death. Anyone who has been delivered from the penalty and power of sin would find going on living in sin to be a miserable existence, not a privilege at all. But all that aside, Paul raises up this question to assert, like he did in the opening verses of this chapter, that a true believer is not capable of carrying on in a habitual lifestyle of sin, that it is theologically impossible for the believer to do that. And this comes out with Paul answering his question with a question, one that appeals to the basic knowledge of his readers where Paul employs an analogy. Look at verse 16. 
He says, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? And the principle is clear. Slavery is marked by obedience. You're a slave of the one whom you obey. And there are only two options. There's no neutrality here. You're either a slave of sin or you're a slave of obedience to God. And each expression of slavery has a distinct outcome. Slavery to sin results in death, which doesn't refer to either of spiritual death or physical death, since those came in through Adam, but instead refers to eternal death, eternal separation from God and eternal everlasting judgment. In contrast, to be a slave of obedience results in righteousness, which can't refer to imputed righteousness, since that comes by faith, nor can it refer to practical righteousness, since that would be asymmetrical with eternal death. No, it instead refers to perfected eternal righteousness, that which will be ours in future final glorification, total conformity to Christ. And so a person's deeds, their life and conduct reveal their master, such that if a person's life is marked by slavery to sin, then they aren't under grace. They remain under the law and are therefore still under the dominion of sin. And Jesus effectively says the same thing. When he says this in John 8, 34, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And there Jesus is referring to a, a, an unbroken, unrepentant, habitual pattern of sin where sin isn't the exception. No, sin is the rule. Those who live lives characterized by obedience to sin prove that they are slaves of sin. Because again, you're a slave of the one whom you obey. So to help us to appreciate the, the marks of the life of a person who's enslaved to sin, I'm going to give you 10 marks, 10 marks that really function as a, a, a character sketch of someone who is still under the power of sin, still enslaved to sin, not under grace. And my reason for doing this is to do one of two things, either to convict you that you are, are under sin in need of grace, or to comfort you that yes, you are under grace because these realities are already apparent in your life. And it may even be to convict you that if you know you're saved, but you aren't currently walking in a manner worthy of the gospel, that this would be the, the, the word you need to snap you out of your spiritual stupor and get up and walk after Christ. So 10 marks I'm going to give you here. One, this is marks of someone who is enslaved to sin. One, their life is marked by an inability to subject themselves to the law of God. Someone who is a slave of sin is marked by an, in, 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 excuse me, an inability to subject themselves to the law of God. Look at Romans 6, or rather Romans 8, verse 6 and following. There, Paul writes, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. To subject yourself to the law of God is to willingly subject yourself to its authority over your life. The kind of willing subjection that issues forth in obedience. And so an inability 
To obey is a distinguishing mark of a slave of sin. All those who have been delivered from the penalty and power of sin not only have the ability to not sin, but also have the ability to obey the word of God. And so the question for you is this, are you able to bring the entirety of your life under the authority of Scripture? Has your will been liberated to subject yourself to the will of God? Or conversely, is your inner man hostile to the word of God, hostile to God and his ways, hostile to his requirements for godly living, such that even if you can affirm that God's ways are right, you know in your inner man that you are resistant and refusing to obey. If you're unable to bring your life under the entirety of the authority of Scripture, you're unable to subject yourself to the law of God, then that would be an indication that you are still a slave of sin. Two, their life is marked by an inability to put sin to death. Their life is marked by an inability to put sin to death. Look at verses 12 and following, same chapter. So then, brethren... We are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And so a distinguishing mark of a true believer is the ability to put sin to death and to do so both proficiently and progressively to demonstrate progress in holiness, sanctification, and spiritual growth is a basic mark of saving faith. It's evidence that you've been born from above and that you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. And so as you serve at your life, are you growing in grace? Is there an undeniable pattern of mortifying sin? Or is sin still ruling and reigning in your life such that you aren't killing sin? No, instead, sin is killing you. That would be another mark of someone who is still a slave to sin. Three, the Spirit doesn't testify that they're a child of God. The Spirit doesn't testify that they're a child of God. Look at verse 15 and following. Paul says, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So bound up in the ministry of the Spirit toward all those who are, who are his is the internal witness of the Spirit that we are children of God, that we belong to God. And it's not only internal, it's experiential. And it's tied to the ministry of the Spirit and God's love for us being shed abroad in our hearts, Romans 5.5. 5. And so there should be an inner conviction that you belong to God, an inner conviction that you are an object of God's saving love. And so do you have that? Does the Spirit testify with your spirit that you are a child of God. Because this is the universal witness of the Spirit to all of God's children. They've been adopted into God's family. And so if the Spirit doesn't testify to you that you're a child of God, that would be a signal that you are not under grace and are a slave to sin. Four, they aren't willing to suffer with Christ. They aren't willing to suffer with Christ. Look at verse 17 of Romans 8. Paul says, And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. So a willingness to suffer with Christ is another distinguishing mark of a true believer. A willingness to bear the reproach of Christ. And that's because an unwillingness to suffer with him is indicative of shame of both him and his words. 
And in Luke 9, 26, he says this, our Lord, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father. And so are you like Moses, who considered the reproach of Christ to be greater riches than all the riches of this world, Hebrews eleven twenty six, 26, or are you ashamed of Christ and unwilling to bear his reproach, unwilling to enter into suffering with him? If you're unwilling, that would be a mark that you are still under the power of sin. Five, and we're going to go to 1 John for this. They don't love the brethren. They don't love the brethren. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 and following. We'll look at a couple of passages in 1 John here. 1 John 2 and verse 9 says, The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So another distinguishing mark of a genuine follower of Christ is love for God's people a supernatural, spirit-generated, undeniable, transcendent love for the people of God. Why do I say transcendent? Because this is a love that is thicker than blood. There's the saying that Water is thicker than blood. Typically, the world would say, no, blood is thicker than water. In the body of Christ, no, water is thicker than blood. And that can be illustrated in a number of ways. One, the love for the brethren that the believer has in their heart is eternal. It's a love that will characterize all of eternity. And many of our family members aren't going to be with us in eternity. And so love for the brethren is that which transcends familial love. In addition, love for the brethren is bound up in our love for and allegiance to Christ, who says this, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26 Love for the brethren has priority over familial love. That's why Jesus says elsewhere that he came to divide a family around faith in him. Now, of course, the best of both worlds is this. When your, your, your family, your, your bloodline, and the, the body of Christ are one and the same. When the members of your household are also members of the body of Christ, in which case you've got both familial love and, and love for the body in one shot. But there are going to be times when that's not the case. And it's love for the brethren that trumps familial love. That's why it's a transcendent love. And so do you love God's people? Do you have an unexplainable love for those who believe on Christ? In fact, when you go to any part of the world and meet a person you've never known and find out they're actually a follower of Christ, you have an instantaneous affection for them. That's a spirit-generated love and signals that you are under grace. But if that love's not there, then it signals you're still a slave of sin. Six, they love the world. They love the world. First John 2, 15 and following. It says, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. So love for the world and love for God are incompatible. It's impossible to love both God and the world simultaneously. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other, Matthew 6, 24. 
which Jesus says in the context of love of wealth. And so you know you love the world when you are in pursuit of what the world values, what the world esteems, where you are in pursuit of what the world is selling, when you're in pursuit of the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh, when your heart disposition toward God is an attitude of independence where you don't need God. You know what that is? That's the boastful pride of life. And the world is always declaring their independence from God, that they don't need him, that they can do this on their own. You know you love the world when you find yourself gravitating to the wisdom of the world. And you need to be careful because the wisdom of the world is often cloaked in Christian garb. Much of the Christian literature out there is worldly wisdom. You know, you know you love the world when God's will as revealed in Scripture isn't the cherished compass of your life. When there is a, another will that rules supreme. And you know you love the world when the hope of heaven has very little appeal to you. Heaven is where we're going. Heaven is our ultimate home. There should be some anticipation. There should be some excitement around leaving this pop stand and going to where our true home is. And so if you look to the hope of heaven as having very little appeal to you, it's likely indicative that you love the world. And if you love the world, then not only is the love of the Father not in you, but you are still under the power of sin. Seven. They aren't submissive to Scripture. They aren't submissive to Scripture. Look at chapter 4, verse 5 and following. Here, John is going to contrast false teachers from the apostles. And so he says, they, referring to false teachers, are from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So one of the distinguishing marks of a true follower of Christ is submission to the apostles' teaching, which is recorded for us in the New Testament. But if there's a lack of submission to that teaching, then it would betray that you're still under the power of sin. And even as you reflect on where we've been in Romans 6, one of the ways to test whether or not you are truly submissive to the apostles' teaching is to evaluate your response to Romans 6. Do you believe that those who are in Christ have died a decisive death to sin? Do you believe that you've been set free from sin? Because if quietly in your heart you do not believe this, if quietly in your heart you are rejecting this and are even looking to examples where you are seeing evidence that it's not true, that this can't be true, I can look at my spouse or, or so-and-so and see that they're not free from sin, and you're questioning the whole thing, and that would signal that you are not submitting to the teaching of Scripture, that the Word of God hasn't found a home in your heart. And all of that would signal again that you are under the power of sin, that you haven't come to the place where you can say with full conviction that this is the inerrant, infallible, and supremely sufficient word of God, where you're willing to call this the word of truth, that it is truth, and to build your life upon it. And if that's the case, then eight, they lack the light for Scripture. Those who are slaves to sin lack delight for Scripture. They can't say with the psalmist, your testimonies are my delight, they are my counselor, Psalm 119.24. They can't say with the psalmist, I shall delight in your commandments, which I love, Psalm 119.47. And they can't say with Job, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. 
One of the distinguishing marks of a true believer is a deep and enduring love for the word of God. An inner conviction that man should not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4. And so if you lack that, if that's not there, then that would be an indication, a signal that you are still a slave of sin. Nine, they don't love Christ. Simply put, they don't love Christ. And Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so love for Christ issues forth in obedience to his word. The litmus test, the evidence that anyone loves Christ is that obedience is the, the, the trajectory of their life. The, the love they have in their heart for Christ produces obedience. And if all of that's true, then 10, they lack the distinguishing fruit of a true apostle, or a true disciple, rather. They lack the distinguishing fruit of a true disciple. And for this, turn to Matthew 7. It'd be worth being able to see this on the pages of Scripture. In verse 16, Jesus says, You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Verse 17, so every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears, bears bad fruit. Verse 18, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a, a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, verse 20, you will know them by their fruits. So there is distinguishing fruit that marks a true disciple of Christ. What are they? Well, we could certainly appeal to the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But fruit also includes the, the previous nine marks that we've just looked at. The ability to subject yourself to the law of God. The ability to put sin to death. The willingness to suffer with Christ, love for God's people, disdain for the world, submissiveness to Scripture, love for God's Word, and the love for Christ that issues forth in obedience. All of that is the fruit of a true disciple. And so in verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You say, well, how can Jesus say that it's only those who do the will of God that enter heaven? Well, it's not because a person secures a place in heaven by doing the will of God. No, it's that doing the will of God is evidence that a person has a place in heaven that they've truly come to Christ, that they've truly been set free from sin, that they are truly under grace. Doing the will of God from the heart is a distinguishing mark of a true disciple. And so when you serve at your life, who is your master? Is your life marked by obedience to sin? Or is it marked by obedience to God? Because as Paul says, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. That's the examination. Now, second, the exaltation. The exaltation expressed in thanksgiving to God. Verse 17 but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. So union with Christ not only results in freedom from sin, but also generates obedience from the heart and obedience to a particular form of teaching, or even better, to a particular pattern of teaching. 
And that Paul refers to this pattern of teaching here implies that there is a measure of distinction between this pattern of teaching and the Mosaic law, that there isn't a one-for-one correlation between the pattern of teaching to which the believer is committed to obeying and what is required in the law of Moses. So why would that be? Well, the reason is this. Because though the Ten Commandments function as a summary of the Mosaic law. There are numerous commandments in the Mosaic law that are not applicable and not relevant to a Gentile Christian. You say, like what? How about circumcision? Or how about the the dietary restrictions? Has anyone had bacon today? Or how about the the ceremonial law? There are aspects of the Mosaic law that are not relevant, that are not applicable. And so that Paul highlights this pattern of teaching here implies that there was and is an authoritative body of teaching distinct from the Mosaic law to which Christians were and are obligated to obey. You say, well, then how can it be that we fulfill the righteous requirement of the law according to the Spirit? Because though there's a distinction in law, there is but one lawgiver. And the moral code required by the New Testament has incredible continuity with the moral code required by the Old Testament. And so by fulfilling the, the, the requirement in the New Testament, we end up fulfilling by the Spirit the requirement of the old. But what I want you to notice about this pattern of teaching is that God delivered us over to it. The end of verse 17 says, to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And that word there, committed, means to be handed over to. It's the same word used in Romans 1, where the nations are given over to sin, climaxing in a depraved mind. And it's a divine passive. This is a a passive tense verb, and a, a divine passive indicates that God is the active agent. It is God who has given us over to this pattern of teaching. And so it's not that we commit ourselves to this pattern of teaching. No, instead it's God commits us to it that God is the ultimate cause of our obedience. And so to accentuate the reality that it's God who generates this obedience in our lives, the LSB says it like this, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were given over. We've been given over to this by God. And this pattern of teaching is such that it molds and shapes our lives. It's it's like an imprint that is left upon our lives that as we come under this pattern of teaching, we begin to be molded into it, where it begins to shape the entire trajectory of our lives as we walk in obedience to it. Which is why in verse 18 it says, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. To be under grace is to be under a new ruling power. The ruling power of righteousness, which as we'll see in verse 19, results in sanctification. And so I kind of want you, I want you to appreciate this. Look at the end of chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Because Paul has been alluding to this already. In Romans 5.20, he says, the law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so to be under the rule and reign of grace is to be under the rule and reign of righteousness, and it's a reign that generates righteousness in all of its constituents. 
And so this is why it's impossible to be under the rule and reign of grace and yet carry on in sin, or why it's impossible to claim to have the saving benefits of Christ without actually reflecting his saving work in your life. If your faith hasn't changed you, then it hasn't saved you. And what I'm going to do is this. In rapid fire succession, I'm going to give you 10 reasons why it is utterly impossible to be a true follower of Christ existing under grace and carry on in habitual, unrepentant sin. And they're going to overlap a little bit. One, regeneration. Regeneration. In regeneration, not only is our cold, dead heart replaced with a living spiritual heart of flesh, but God places his spirit within us and causes us to walk in his ways, resulting in heartfelt obedience. Two, the permanent presence of the indwelling spirit. The permanent presence of the indwelling spirit. The spirit has taken up permanent and eternal residence within us, and not only enables and empowers our obedience, but also works to conform us ever more into the image of Christ, resulting in progressive sanctification. Three, eternal life. Eternal life. In salvation, we receive eternal life. The very life of God comes into us and transforms us from the inside out, resulting in ever-increasing degrees of godliness. Four, the operation of grace. The operation of grace in salvation, we come under the unmerited, saving, forgiving, redeeming, sanctifying, enabling, equipping, irrevocable, and eternal operation of grace. And it is an infallibly efficacious operation, always accomplishing its purpose. Five, enslavement to the ruling power of righteousness enslavement to the ruling power of righteousness, that in the same way that we were once slaves of sin, which has resulted in the multiplication of sin, we are now slaves of righteousness, and that results in the multiplication of righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Six, deliverance from the power of sin. Deliverance from the power of sin. That we've been set free from sin delivered from sin's dominion and released from all obligations to sin. We have zero obligations to sin. Seven, released from the law. Released from the law. That we have been released from that which, due to our fallen condition, only served to aid and abet sin by strengthening its power, producing nothing more than fruit for death within us. Eight, the sanctifying work of God. The sanctifying work of God, that it's God who is at work in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, Philippians 2.13. That the work he began will be perfected until the day of Christ Jesus, Philippians 1.6. And that he has predestined us to total, complete conformity to Christ, which will be realized in glorification, Romans 8.29 and 30. Nine, the discipline of the Lord the discipline of the Lord, that even when we err, God will lovingly discipline us for the purpose of us sharing in his holiness, Hebrews 12.10, that we would possess the peaceful fruit of righteousness, Hebrews 12.11 and 10. Why it is impossible for a true, regenerate believer to carry on as if nothing has changed is love for Christ. Love for Christ. That because of God's work in our hearts, we love the Lord Jesus Christ. And we long to do his will and to walk in the willing, eager obedience that is even pictured in the seraphim that cry out at his throne, holy, holy, holy. Holy. 
And so do you see why it is impossible to be under the rule and reign of grace and carry on in sin? Why it's impossible to be one who has the saving benefits of Christ, but yet show no marks of saving faith. Be walking in an unbroken, habitual, unrepentant pattern of sin. It can't be done. It's not that the believer is incapable of sin. And it's not that the believer is incapable of a season of sin. But the believer cannot stay there. The true believer will be miserable in that place. And the Lord will discipline them. And the Spirit will work in their lives. And they will come to a place of repentance. And they will renew their resolve to follow after Christ. And they will pursue him to the glory of God and to the glory and honor of Christ. That's the exaltation. Now, third, the exhortation. The exhortation, which is really a reiteration of the exhortation of verse 13. So look at verse 19. Paul says, I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. You ever wonder why Paul says that? Why does Paul say that? Well, he's just used an analogy. And what is true typically of analogies? They often fail. And the failure of the analogy that he's just used is that he's just described liberation from sin as slavery to righteousness, which would seem to imply that our slavery to righteousness is against our will. And yet nothing could be further from the truth. We are willing, joyful slaves of righteousness. And yet that doesn't come out in the analogy. In the analogy, it would seem that we've been made slaves of righteousness against our will. That's not true. We, we love righteousness. We want nothing more than to walk in righteousness, to walk in perfect, total righteousness. And so Paul is acknowledging the weakness of his analogy but he's employed it to assist us due to our weakness in comprehending these lofty spiritual realities. It's not to say that we aren't enslaved to righteousness. It's just to say that it is a willing, joyful slavery. Next part of verse 19. For just as you presented the members, your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness... So now, here's the command, present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. What does that signal? That even our slavery to sin was not against our will. When we were slaves of sin, we were willing, compliant, even joyful slaves. Eager and willing slaves. And we willingly presented ourselves to impurity and lawlessness, resulting in even more lawlessness. But now, having been liberated from sin and having been made eager and willing slaves of obedience, present yourselves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification, a sanctification that will progress throughout the Christian life and will climax in complete sanctification, glorification, perfected righteousness. And that'll be realized when the goal of our salvation reaches its end. And let me encourage you with this, that if you're in Christ and you submit yourself to this exhortation to present yourself to God for righteousness sake, and you give yourself to the means that God has appointed for your spiritual growth and development, employing even the proper tools for the mortification of sin, then your progress in sanctification is guaranteed. 
You will grow in godliness. You will become ever more increasingly like Christ. The patterns of sin of your former life will be reversed, and your life will bring great honor and glory to God. And so feast on the word of God. Be devoted to prayer. Be filled with the Spirit, walking by his enabling power, and give thanks to God for placing you under the liberating and constraining rule and reign of grace. And so who is your master? Is your master righteousness, where it's evident that you are under the ruling power of righteousness, where sin is not the rule but the exception? Or do you remain under the ruling power of sin, where sin is not the exception but the rule, where it's evident that sin is your master. Because if it's the latter, then you need to come to Christ. And you need to come all the way to Christ. You need to come all the way to him to the point that you would burn every bridge behind you. So there's no way back. Because it's in him that the power of sin is broken. He came to live the life that we couldn't, to fulfill the law on our behalf. And then he went to the cross. And while on that cross, he suffered under the full weight of the fury of the righteous wrath of God. And he bore it in his own body. He swallowed it up in full. And when he had finished, he gave up his last breath, died, went into the grave, and rose on the third day, proving he had conquered both sin and death. And then he ascended back to the right hand of the Father. And if you would turn from your sin and you would lay hold of him by faith, if you would come all the way to him by faith and burn every bridge behind you and give your entire life to him, not only will your sin be forgiven, not only will you have the hope of heaven, but you will be enslaved to a new ruling power, the ruling power of righteousness, and you will walk in an entirely new trajectory bearing fruit that brings honor and glory to God and demonstrates the saving work of Christ in your life. And so we would urge you, we would beseech you to turn from your sin and believe on him and be saved, be freed, and be given the guarantee of future glory. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we realize that only the Spirit of God can do the convicting work to, on the one hand, testify that we are, in fact, your children that we have, in fact, been delivered from sin, that we are under a new ruling power, the ruling power of righteousness. And we also acknowledge that only the Spirit can convict us to demonstrate that we're still under the power of sin. And so if there be any here who have maybe sat for years under the preaching of your word, have maybe been attending church Sunday in and Sunday out for years, maybe even since they were children, and yet have never truly come all the way to Christ, we would pray that you would convict them with clarity to be able to see their condition as it is, and that seeing their condition, you would open their eyes to the glories of Christ that they would come all the way to him by faith and be truly saved and delivered from the penalty and power of sin with the hope of heaven before them. Do that, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.